This video is brought to you by Audible. The tortoise and the hare. You know the story, the idea that slow and steady wins the race. It's one of the most retold stories in history. The moral being that slow, constant, persistent effort will always win out over bursts of frantic activity. Although the moral of the story has actually changed many times over the years, it's actually kind of interesting when you look back at how different eras interpreted it. It's more of a reflection of their own values, you know? For example, some people interpret it to be a, a moral story about, you know, overconfidence and pride. It kind of shows the, the hare's moral failings. But that's neither hare nor there. <laughs> Jeff Bezos is a fan of the tortoise and the hare analogy. He actually used that to come up with the motto for Blue Origin, which is gratitum ferociter, step-by-step uh, step ferociously is what that means. He actually uses a tortoise as a symbol for the company. But nowhere does the whole slow and steady approach ring more true than with ion drives, the slowest and somehow fastest form of space propulsion out there. The thorn in the side of every rocket scientist is what they call the tyranny of the rocket equation. It's the whole thing where the more weight you want to put into space, the more fuel you need to get it there. Of course, that fuel adds more weight, which requires more fuel, which adds more weight, which requires more fuel. The tyranny. Now that's just about getting off of Earth, but the same thing applies in space. The bigger the ship, the more weight, the more fuel you need to get it to where you want it to go. Now, most of the stuff that we launch, the vast majority of it, stays pretty close to Earth, so it doesn't really matter that much, but if you really want to go a-traveling, it becomes a problem. Now traditionally, our planetary probes use short burns from chemical rockets to just kind of point them in the direction they need to go, and then they just float and coast the rest of the way forward, sometimes using gravity assist from planets to pick up speed along the way. As I pointed out in my Voyager video, they took advantage of a rare planetary alignment, which allowed them to kind of swing past all the planets in one fell swoop. Uh, the next chance of something like that happening again would be sometime in the 2030s. But this kind of travel is extremely limited, and it's not a very good solution if we really want to travel throughout the solar system. Finding a way around the tyranny of the rocket equation is the key to us becoming a spacefaring species. And so far, the best one we've come up with is the ion drive. Ion drives are a type of electric propulsion that uses incredibly small thrust, but uses it continuously, so over time it can build up to incredible speeds. Whereas a chemical rocket can only burn for a few minutes at a time before it shuts off and then just coasts, an ion engine can run for weeks, even months at a time, building up to speeds of 90,000 meters per second, or 200,000 miles an hour. For comparison, Voyager 1, which is the fastest object we've ever created, is traveling at 17,000 meters per second. And it does it using electricity. The way an ion engine works is fairly self-explanatory. First, it's an engine that creates thrust by using ions. Now, ions are basically charged atoms, and what gives atoms a charge are its electrons. Electrons, as you know, are negatively charged, so an atom with an extra electron is a negatively charged ion. An atom that's missing an electron is a positively charged ion. Make sure and write that down. You're gonna need to understand that to understand everything else I'm talking about here. Now, there are many different types of ion engines, but most of them use xenon as a fuel. And xenon is a noble gas, which means that its electron shell is completely full and it doesn't form covalent bonds with other atoms, so it doesn't really form into molecules at all. Basically, it doesn't react with any other elements. So if you were able to knock an electron out of a xenon atom, you would have a positively charged xenon ion. Still with me? Because here we go. So the way an ion drive works is on one end you have a cathode which fires two beams, one a beam of electrons and the other a beam of xenon atoms. The electrons collide with the xenon atoms and knock loose an electron, making them positively charged. These positive ions are guided through the ionization chamber by a series of electromagnets toward a pair of grids at the other end. The innermost grid is positively charged and the outer grid is negatively charged. Because positive is attracted to negative, they're accelerated toward the negative grid, which causes them to fly out the back of the ship and that creates a propulsion. Now there is one more step to make this work, because the natural thing that that positive ion is going to want to do once it fires out the back is to turn around and be attracted to that negatively charged grid. And that would actually kill the acceleration. So how do you prevent that from happening? You reintroduce an electron. So right above the exhaust, there's a nozzle that fires electrons into the cloud of xenon ions. The ions take in the electron, which neutralizes their charge, and allows them to continue their acceleration away from the ship. And of course, the reason this works is because of Newton's third law, the whole every action has an equal and opposite reaction thing. Now in chemical rockets, this works by igniting the fuel in a combustion chamber and then directing that out through the engine bell. All the energy is released in one direction, pushing the mass of the rocket in the other direction. It's the same idea in ion drives, but on a much, much smaller scale. Literally every atom of xenon that flies out the back pushes the ship forward with the weight of one xenon atom. Which, by the way, is the reason why they picked xenon. Xenon is the heaviest noble gas that's not radioactive, which gives it a higher specific impulse. But still, it's so small that the amount of thrust this engine puts out is the same amount of thrust that your hand creates while holding up a sheet of paper. 
But again, even a tiny thrust like this used continuously can add up over time. The Dawn spacecraft, for example, took four days to get up to 60 miles an hour. And it's all generated by electricity, which the probe can create by using huge solar panels. Or if it's really far away from the sun, it could use nuclear. The only limitation is the xenon gas. You will eventually run out of that. But the engine is so efficient that when NASA was testing their next engine, they ran it for five years straight and only use 700 kilograms of xenon. This, by the way, is why people are so interested in the, you know, impossible M drive, because it doesn't use any propellant at all. And while the thrust that they claim it produces is incredibly, incredibly small, again, over time, that adds up. Unfortunately, it does look like with the latest test that the M drive is a bit of a dud. It's not really gonna work after all, boo. And this might all sound like brand new technology, but ion drives have actually been around for a while. In fact, Robert Goddard was theorizing about them back in 1906. The first public mentions of ion drives were published back in 1911 by Konstantin Tchaikovsky. Tchaikovsky, by the way, is the creator of the tyrannical rocket equation that I was referring to earlier. Goddard actually tested some prototype designs in 1916 at Clark University, but the first functional ion drive was created in 1959 at the Lewis Research Center, now called the Glenn Research Center. NASA first tested an ion drive in space on board the Space Electric Rocket Test, or CERT-1, in 1964, which was just a suborbital flight. It later tested on orbital flight in 1970 on CERT-2. At the same time, the Soviets were testing Hall Effect thrusters, which are a type of ion drive that uses magnetic fields to accelerate the ions. And they actually used them on spacecraft from 1972 into the 90s, mostly to make minor orbital adjustments and to provide stability. Since then, there have been a slew of new ion drive designs, each of them finding new ways to accelerate the ions faster and burn the engine longer, like NASA's NSTAR engine, the NEXT engine, and the privately run Vasimir engine, which has the potential to get to Mars in only 36 days. One engine that's made some headlines recently is NASA's X3 ion engine, which actually produces a thousand times more thrust than a traditional ion engine. There have been a handful of major missions that have used ion propulsion, including NASA's Deep Space One mission from 1998, the Hayabusa mission from the Japanese Space Agency JAXA, which did a sample return mission from a comet, the SMART-1 mission from the ESA that orbited the moon, and last but definitely not least, the aforementioned DAWN mission from NASA that examined the asteroids Vesta and Ceres and is currently still in operation. Some future ion drive missions that are in the works is the Bepi Colombo mission, which is destined for Mercury, and the Mars Cat mission, which is going to kind of piggyback on the Mars 2020 rover. Now all that's well and good, but the true promise of ion drives is the ability to go further much, much further. The only hope we have of ever getting to another star is to go blazingly fast, the kind of fast that you just can't achieve with chemical rockets. Ion drives, possibly combined with a solar sail or some kind of laser boost, is the best chance we have of getting to another star in less than a generation. And while there aren't any interstellar ion drive probes in the works just yet, I look forward to the day when an ion drive probe overtakes Voyager 1. And the tortoise finally beats the hare. I'm curious what you guys think. Have you done any research on ion drives? Do you have any favorite ion drives in the works? Let me know in the comments. Ultimately, if we're ever going to become a space-faring civilization, we're going to have to find new physics and embrace new ideas to get around in this gigantic universe. Which is why I'm going to recommend the book The Physics of the Future by Michio Kaku, which you can download for free at Audible. Audible is a new sponsor for this show, and to be honest with you, I never really listen to audiobooks very much. I listen to a lot of podcasts. Until recently, I never really listened to audiobooks. And then I'd turn around and whine because I would be falling behind on my books and I'd be all upset because I couldn't catch up and I didn't have time to read anymore. And then I realized I'm an idiot. Audible has just about any book you could ever want to read and you can listen to it while you're driving your car or doing the dishes, doing the laundry, working out, often narrated by the authors themselves. They've got apps for any platform, iOS, Android, Windows Phone, you name it. And if you go to audible.com slash Joe Scott or text Joe Scott to 500-500, you can get a 30-day free trial and get your first book for free. You could try Michio Kaku's book or any book that sounds good to you and try it out for free. You'll be amazed what fits in your brain. So that's audible.com slash Joe Scott for a free 30-day trial. Links down in the description. And I want to give a big shout out to the Answer Files on Patreon that are helping to support this channel. We've got some new people that have joined the group. Um, a whole lot of names. Let me try to get through them real quick. We've got Christopher Lee, James Davis, Iman Kalaf, uh, Paul Chalice, Roman Schlegel, Bob McDuffie, Thor Iverson, James Spall, Andrew du G. Penn, Andrew Irving, Shervin House, Robert Longamore, Rajat Kumar Padi, Jim Yarbrough, uh, Anthony Galzmarano, 
Samuel Price, Joshua Davis, Martin Cabrera, Luke Adams, Stephanie Mills, Ken Hem, Leo Baruti, and Tyler Tompkins. Wow, thank you guys so much. If you would like to join them and get access to stuff that other people don't get to have and just join a really awesome community, you can go to patreon.com slash answers with Joe. Please like and share this video if you like it. And if this is your first time here, I invite you to watch some of my other videos. And if you like those too, uh, hit the subscribe button. You'll be the first to see them every Monday. And if you are subscribed, hit the bell, join the notification squad. You're a special person now. All right, thanks again for watching. You guys go out now and have an eye-opening week and I'll see you next Monday. Love you guys, take care.